Welcome to another Advent Difficult walkthrough video. Today we'll be looking at 2022 Day 16. So I was stuck on this one for quite a while, so I wasn't able to get it done last night because I had to sleep for an exam today. So I finished it earlier this morning, and so apologies for the late video. Um, I'll be posting updates like this when my schedule changes to my Discord, so if you want to stay informed on updates like this, uh, be sure to check it out. I'll leave the link in the description. So. The sensors have led us to the origin of the distress signal, um, another handheld device, just like the device given to us. But we don't actually see any elves around, the device is surrounded by elephants. The elephants must have gotten lost in these tunnels, and one of them apparently figured out to turn on the distress signal. So the ground is rumbling again, much stronger this time. You scan the cave, and you see mostly igneous rocks, some ash, and pockets of pressurized gas. This isn't just a cave, you're inside a volcano. You need to get the elephants out of here ASAP, and your device estimates that you have 30 minutes before eruption, so you don't have time to go back out the way you came in. You look at the cave for some other options, and you see a network of pipes and pressure release valves. You're not sure how the system got there, but you don't have time to complain. Your device gives you a report, which is your puzzle input, of each valve's flow rate if it were opened uh, in pressure per minute, and the tunnels you can use to move between valves. There's a valve in the room that you're current, you and the elephants are currently in called AA. You estimate it will take you a minute to open one valve and a minute to take any tunnel. What's the most pressure you could release? So this is our example input. We start in room AA, which has a flow rate of zero and tunnels going to DD, II, and BB. So all of the valves start out closed, which means that they're not releasing any pressure. You start at AA, but it's damaged or jammed or something because the flow rate is zero, so if you open it, it's not going to actually do anything. So instead, you could spend a minute moving to BB and a minute opening it, which would release pressure over the next 28 minutes at a flow rate of 13. So if you were to go to BB and open it, it would release a total of 364 pressure. That's 28 minutes times the flow rate of 13 pressure per minute. Then you could spend another minute moving from BB to CC and a fourth minute opening it, which would give you two times the remaining 26, uh, which is 52 more pressure released. You can keep going through the tunnels and opening valves like this up until the 30 minute mark, but you need to release as much pressure as possible, so you need to pick a good method. And so instead the optimal path here would be to go from AA to DD, because DD has a much higher flow rate, so opening it earlier is better. You can't this can't really be traversed in a typical graph theory fashion. The issue is the weights of the nodes are constantly changing. That's because the weight is equal to the flow rate times the amount of remaining time. So even if we skip over a valve, it might be op optimal. So let's say, for example, that we only have three valves, A, B, and C. And let's say that going from A to B takes one minute and going from B to C takes five minutes. So let's just imagine there are a bunch of uh, blocked valves in the middle. Then going from A to B and then directly to C and opening it up and then going back to B to open that is actually more optimal. Because even though we spend five minutes, even though we open B like 10 minutes later, if B releases like one pressure per minute and C releases 100, then it's optimal to open C one minute earlier at the cost of opening B 10 minutes later. So this isn't a standard graph traversal algorithm. Moreover, notice that four of these valves are blocked and have a flow rate of zero. This is actually crucial to this problem. If we look at our test, uh, sorry, our actual input, you'll notice that there are a lot of valves, but almost all of them are blocked. In fact, out of these, we can do a quick search and see that only 15 of them actually have a flow rate. So let's see what the problem actually asks us first. It asks us, over the 30 minutes, what is the most amount of pressure that we can possibly release? So the solution we're going to try is roughly brute force-ish. We're going to basically try every single possible path. Of course, with 66 nodes and a depth of 30, that is going to be pretty much impossible to actually compute. So what we're instead going to do is compress the paths we don't actually care what valves we visit in between opening valves. And we also never want to go to a valve to open it if it doesn't release any pressure. 
So we're essentially going to collapse our graph into just 16 nodes, the 15 that have stuff, and then AA, because we need to have the node that we start from. So let's first read our input. So we're going to keep track of the valves themselves, which is going to point from the name to the flow rate. And then we're going to keep track of the tunnels. So for each line in the input, we're going to first split it on spaces and get the uh, index one. So valve equals line dot split at index one. The flow rate we can get by splitting on semicolons and getting the part right before it. So uh, flow equals int of line dot split semicolon, the part right before it. And then we split that again on the equal sign and get the part right after it. And finally, we can get the list of valves by splitting on the word valve. Um, shoot, this is a bit tricky. Splitting on the word two, and then splitting on spaces, getting rid of the first one, and then splitting on commas and getting rid of everything else. So here's how we'll do it. Um, targets equals line dot split two. So that will get this part, and then we'll take one. The reason we can't split on the word valves is because some of them only lead to one valve. So once again, annoying AOC input format. So we'll split on the word two, get this part, and then we'll split on spaces, but we'll put a one here, which means that we will only split up to once. So we'll split on this space, but then leave this, this part intact. We'll get the first element of that and then we'll split on comma space. So if we print out the valve flow and targets, we should hopefully get the correct output. So let's test this on our test input. This looks correct, except for the new lines at the end. We can deal with that by just putting a line equals line dot strip up here. Okay, so now valves at valve equals flow and tunnels at valve equals targets. So now we have two dictionaries. The first one tells us the flow rate of each valve. And the second one tells us uh, where each valve leaves. So essentially what we're trying to do next is compress our graph to take out all of the uh, nodes with flow rate zero. I'll call them empty nodes. So what we want to keep is a graph of the non-empty nodes where we know the distance between any two nodes, so the travel time from one node to the next. So essentially we want to know the travel time between all pairs and then filter out the ones that are empty. The algorithm that can be used to find all the shortest path between all pairs is called the floyd warshall algorithm. And um, this is what Beta Veros used in his solution. Uh, a lot of the inspiration for my solution comes from his. Um, but Floyd Warshall, I don't think is actually the most efficient here because it generates the shortest distance between all pairs. We only need the shortest distance from 15 or sorry, 16 select nodes to everything else. So Floyd Warshall is actually slightly inefficient here because it's O of N cubed, whereas breadth first search is O of N plus M. So if we repeat that 15 times, it would be worst case Floyd Warshall or actually a bit worse, but we are only looking at a select number of nodes here. Uh, the advantage to using Floyd Warshall is that it's probably a bit easier to implement here. I'll go over it in my planned upcoming graph theory video, though. So we're going to keep a dists dictionary, and now we're just going to loop through each valve for valve in valves. If the valve is not equal to AA and it's an empty node, we can just ignore it. We can't ignore AA because we need to know where we can go from AA. So see when we're looking at this valve, we'll start off, we'll set dists at valve equal to an array. And we don't want to check if we can go from a valve to itself because that will never be useful. So we'll store valve and AA here first, and then at the end, we'll delete them.
This is because even if a tunnel leads back to A, we don't want to revisit it because its valve is closed. And you can verify that um, A has a flow rate of zero. And this is always the case for your inputs, I believe. Because the problem statement makes a point of emphasizing that AA is uh, blocked. So now we just need to do a breadth first search to all of them. So we'll do, um, let's import queues. We'll add a visited set. And then queue equals new deck, starting with just uh, zero for the distance and valve for the starting point. And then while Q distance uh, position equals Q dot pop left. Um, for each neighbor in tunnels of position, uh, if it's visited already, we skip it. And if not, we add it to the visited set. And then we can just set dist's evolve neighbor equal to the distance plus one. But as a slight optimization here, what we'll do is we'll actually ignore any nodes that are empty. So if valve neighbor, only if the uh, neighbor is non-empty, we'll add it to the dist's map. And then finally q.append uh, distance plus one neighbor. So now if we print out dist's, we have a map from every, we have a map from every node to every non-empty node that it can reach, uh, which in this case is everything because the graph is connected, and also the distance it would take to travel there. So now we're just going to do a slightly smarter brute force. So the brute force we'll do is essentially a depth first search. At each point, we track three things in the state, the time remaining, the total flow, and which nodes are open so far. So um, because the number, uh, so here's the thing. Uh, we cannot just brute force with no optimizations. It will take way too long. What we can do is memoization, which is essentially recursion, but we're putting it into a cache. And by the way, I think breadth first search probably works too, but I'm, I'm not sure if the number of concurrent states would become too large and cause your program to slow down. The advantage of depth first search is it only goes along one branch at a time. Uh, so because we need to traverse every possible path, BFS and DFS won't actually be different in terms of their theoretical complexity. So we're going to keep a cache. So if we ever see the same state twice, we don't need to recompute everything. And we will reach the same state a lot of times because um, just in the example, if we brute forced, we would go through AA, BB, DD, and then the remainder, and also A, D, D, B, B, and then the remainder. So we will need to cache because if we're in the same position, and we have the same amount of time left, and the same current valves are opened, we don't need to recompute anything. We already have the state because it's deterministic. So the problem here is that we can't store the uh, remaining valves as a set because sets cannot be the index of a dictionary. We could store it as a tuple and just put things in as in sorted order, but that is quite slow. What we can actually do is something known as a bit mask, because for each valve, it's either on or off, and there are only 15 nodes. So if we represent each valve state as a one or a zero and pack them all into one number, it would only take 15 bits. So two to the power of 15 is 32,768, which is pretty small. So we can just store it as a number. So let's create our cache and let's define DFS which will take three arguments, the time remaining, the valve we're currently at, and the bit mask representing which valves are currently uh, open. So we'll have a max value, uh, max val equals zero, and at the end we'll return max val, which will just represent what's the maximum amount of flow we can gain given the current conditions. So we'll start with valve at AA, 
so we won't attempt to open the current valve. Instead what we'll do is we'll look for all possible other valves that we can go to and then open. So we'll open the next valve in the DFS function instead of opening it at the, opening the current valve at the top. So we can just do for neighbors in dists from valve. This time we're not doing tunnels because we only want to look at valves that matter. Um, we'll need to calculate the amount of time remaining. So if we were to go to this neighbor, the amount of time it'll take is dists valve to neighbor. Oh, sorry, this is meant to be singular. And then we add one because we need to open the valve. And so the amount of time remaining if we took this step is time minus this value. So if the remaining time is less than or equal to zero, then there's no point opening the valve because even if we open it, it won't be open for any time, so it won't release any pressure. And if the time is less than zero, we can't even reach it. So we will just continue. Otherwise, a possibility is to explore this state. And in this state, the time would be rem time. The valve that we're currently at is now neighbor. And the bit mask will calculate that in a bit. And so how we're going to combine our steps together is maxval is going to be the max of maxval currently. And we'll call DFS to explore this state. But the thing is right now, everything's returning zero. So we need to add the flow that will be gained. How much flow will be gained from opening the valve neighbor? Well, it's just the valve value of neighbor, the flow rate, times the amount of time remaining. Because if we open it with two minutes left, then the amount of flow release overall is its flow rate times that two minutes. Now we deal with the bit mask. So in order to handle the bit mask, we're going to need to be able to index all of the relevant valves into a bit position. So we're going to need to keep track of all the relevant valves. I'll make a list called non-empty here. And then I'll do this. If valve is uh, not equal to AA, then that means that it's relevant because we skipped all irrelevant AA, uh, non-AA valves. So we'll do non-empty dot append valve. So now we have a list of relevant valves. We just need to get it into an index dictionary because searching through the list each time does add a significant overhead. So indices equals a dictionary for index element in non uh, enumerate non empty. The index of element will equal the current position. So this will give us indices from zero up to n minus one. And so our bit mask will have n bits where the rightmost bit is zero, then one, then two, then three, etc. And so to reach that bit, the bit will be um, indices of valve, uh, sorry, neighbor. And then in order to get it into the right position, we'll do one left shift by that. And so if this part is equal to zero, one left shift zero is just one. One left shift one would be two, one left shift two would be four. Basically we take all of the bits of our current number, which is just a one, and then we shift them to the left by the specified amount, putting zeros on the right side as we go. So since bitmask stores the valves that are currently open, then if the uh, valve is already open, we can just skip this. So if bitmask bitwise and bit, then continue. What this does is bitmask is a number representing all of the open um, valves. So for example, bitmask might be something like 110100, meaning the first valve is closed, the second is closed, the third is open, the fourth is closed, the fifth is open, and the sixth is open. So if we're looking at the fifth valve, then we would have left shifted one to the left, uh, sorry, if we're looking at valve at index four, then we've shifted one to the left four times. So it'll look like this, zero, one, sorry, zero, one, two, three, and then the fourth valve is this. So if we take the bitwise and, we essentially stack them up like this and then go bit by bit. And so we would have 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And so this is not equal to 0, so it would be considered true. If we were looking at valve 3, then we would get this configuration, where this bit here is the only one that could be 1, 
but it would equal zero here. So since this is zero, this condition would not pass. So we would not skip it. So apologies if the bit mask map is, math is a bit confusing. Um, there are some good resources on bitwise arithmetic. You just need to look them up. There are quite a few. Um, it is a bit annoying at first, but once you get used to it, it's quite convenient for stuff like this. So now we'll calculate the new bit mask here. Since the bit was off here, then we'll turn it on to represent that we have the valve now open in this new state. So bit mask or bit. We'll now do the same operation with the comparing bit by bit, but we'll use the logical or. So since the only one in the bit position in the right side is the valve we're currently opening, all of the other valves will be unaffected. n or 0 is just n, and so the other valves states will stay the same. We'll just turn on the current one that we're looking at. The final thing we need to do is keep the ca uh, use the cache. Right now, this DFS function isn't using the cache, so it might be recomputing states all the time. If time valve bitmask in cache, we will return it. And otherwise, at the end, right before we return, we'll add it into the cache. And now to get our answer, we just run the DFS with 30 minutes remaining, starting at valve AA, and with a bitmask of zero to represent no valves initially open. Um, shoot, what did I do this time? Okay, yeah, so I just messed up the condition here. This is supposed to skip empty valves, so we need to put a not here. So now if we run it, it still doesn't work. What does it say now? String indices must be integers. Right. Because this is supposed to be valves, my apologies. And this gives us our intended answer of 1651. And if we run it on our real input, we get 1673. Moving on to part two. You're worried that you won't be able to release enough pressure even optimally. So what if you get one of the elephants to help you? It takes you four minutes to teach an elephant how to open the right valves in the right order, which leaves you and the elephant with 26 minutes to actually execute the plan. Fortunately, you only need to teach one elephant. It doesn't ask you to teach. You don't have to go through every single possible number of elephants. Um, if you teach the elephant, what is the optimal pressure? So in other words, given 26 minutes and two workers, what is the optimal amount of pressure you could release? So although this might sound suboptimal, or too, sorry, this is probably suboptimal. Although this might sound too slow, it actually isn't because using the cache for the DFS does actually save us a huge amount of time. What we're going to do is we're going to attempt to partition the relevant valves into every single possible pair. Uh, sorry, every single possible uh, pair of sets that adds up to it. In other words, we're going to split all of the unblocked valves into two sets and you will go to one of them and the elephant will go to the other. And since we're not sure which of these sets is optimal, we will just try every possible partition. This turns out to not actually be too hard to calculate. Because remember that this uh, DFS function checks the possible, the optimal possible flow to release given time, valve, and the current valves open. So we can actually forge the bit mask at the start by declaring the other partitions valves as already open, so our DFS will not check. The DFS doesn't check what the optimal flow released at the end is, it checks what the optimal increase in pressure released is given the valves we can open. So if we pretend that our current valves are open and don't add anything to the flow rate, the DFS will calculate what the maximum pressure released is given the remaining valves. And so how do we compute that? Well, it's actually not very hard. Um, the maximum bit mask value is two to the power of the number, uh, the size of non-empty minus one. So we'll call it B is equal to one left shift length of non-empty minus one. So one left shift non-empty will look something like this, which will leave this bit 
right outside. So since we left shifted uh, n times, there will be n zeros, each one representing an existing valve. So if we subtract one, then this becomes a one and it needs to carry from here, which needs to carry from here. And essentially we just keep doing that until we reach this one and it gets deleted. And so this would be the end state. It would be n ones, which represents all valves currently open. So now we just need to do for i in range b plus one. So we're going to loop starting from zero and going up to b. We will partition into two. So i represents a possible bit mask for valves. So i represents one of the possible states. And what is the other state? Well, it's b but with all of the i bits excluded. So it's b x or i. Or you could also just do b minus i. Since b is a bunch of ones, then if we have some random configuration of valves that are currently open, the opposite partition would be to flip all of the bits, which you can get by XORing. Also, you can just do subtraction. So we will do plus DFS A and then B X or I. And also remember to change this to 26 because we only have 26 minutes left. And this gives us one possibility for our partition. So now we just need to track a global max. And then at the end, we print M. Finally, one slight optimization that we can make is that um, we never need to check. Uh, basically, what we're doing right now is going to check a bunch of duplicate cases. So let's just imagine we have four valves. We're going to be checking both 01101001. And later on, we're also going to check 1001010. But you and the elephant are indistinguishable here. So you don't actually need to check all of the states. You only need to check up to half of them. Because if the first valve is open, then we can just flip the order of these two and get a state that we already had. And so this won't actually run uh, too much faster. And the reason is our DFS cache will catch this inefficiency and handle it for us because both I and BX or I will already be in the cache. But letting us exit our loop a bit earlier might just make it a bit faster. It doesn't really matter too much. And now if we run it on our test, we get 1707. And if we run on our actual input, it will take a while, but let's see how long it takes. It is going through two to the power of 15 states and each state does go to a depth of like quite a bit. So it will still take a bit of time to run. Um, yeah, 2343 in 18.18 seconds. So under 20 seconds. So it's not actually that bad. 2343. Three. So the key observations to make here are Firstly, the amount of zero flow rate valves means that we shouldn't be looking at the entire graph. We want to compress it and only keep a subgraph of non-empty valves and their distances to each other. Then we recognize that using a cached DFS allows us to brute force all possible paths without it being horribly inefficient. And the final observation to make is that it's fast enough to just partition our set of valves into every single possible uh, split of two sets and then just run the brute force for all of them. And this will be initially slow, but as the loop runs and more and more uh, states fill up the cache, this becomes increasingly fast because we finish our computation earlier with more items in the cache. So that's all for this video. Um, if you're confused about anything, please feel free to leave a comment. Um, I know that today's pacing was a bit fast and the content is a bit difficult to uh, understand, but hopefully I was able to explain it decently enough that you sort of get a rough understanding of the solution I went with, uh, which is quite similar to Betaverus's. I'll link his video because he did screen record his solving process today. Um, I was took quite a bit of hints from his subreddit comment, which I'll also link. Also, thank you to him for that. And otherwise, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed and learned something. And I'll see you tomorrow for day 17.